This is Iphion uniflorum subspecies Tandiliens. It's a really pale, slightly warm, icy blue. But the key thing, I don't know if the camera on my tablet is picking them up, but mm. on the back of those flowers are these lovely stripes. A five months flower from them. And then they go dormant and disappear in the heat of the summer. So really good future plants, I think. You're giving me ideas, Mr. Fuller. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the idea, Alan? Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> And welcome to episode 108 of Talking Dirty over at East Ruston Old Vicarage, wearing a polo neck that to me looks a bit like one of those optical illusions, like one half mirroring the other. I feel like I'm going to see a strange creature in it or something. We have Alan Edward Herbert Gray, our happy and very handsome horticulturalist. <laughs> and from this very strange mythical creature sitting here on a somewhat wet and sort of scudding day, um, it is the wonderful, blooming thought is Maria <laughs> Sophia Fridrikson, who's the ray of sunshine and just looks so wonderful. I've dressed for spring. You're you have. up for winter. I'm actually quite cold, but this is we've probably got room for one more podcast before I pop, but I wanted to sort of go full colourful. <laughs> and you'll have noticed there are only two of us. We also, before we have to pause the podcast for a little bit, we wanted to talk about some of the wonderful things happening at East Ruston Old Vicarage and uh, and also give me a chance to revel in some of the plants I'm missing out on because I haven't been able to travel over to you for <laughs> a few weeks. So this is kind of an East Ruston Old Vicarage spring special on Talking Dirty and it hasn't been the most sort of beautiful weather so far. The garden is open, visitors are still being bowled over by the season but I'm assuming it's a little bit slower to perform than it was last year. Well it's one of those strange things some I mean you know we've had we've had very strange climatic happenings and we really um we had that very strange summer last year which went on and on and on and then we had lots of rain and everything that all the plants that had gone to sleep or estivated started growing again and they were growing right through into november which was still very very mild and then december hit us with a whammy a frost and we don't have very much frost in this garden and we had minus 4.5 and that had um a profound effect on quite quite a number of plants I mean, fuchsias that had been against a wall and had got seven feet tall, probably against the wall, completely gone. Mm. Um, but you've got to look upon it as an opportunity. I have to say that because, you know, I do sort of push my boundaries when it comes to planting. So we say hardy plants. But then I ask myself, what is hardy? Who knows? And we've got this very strange spring, as you just said, when we've had this lovely sort of kind of balmy weather. And it's been a very dry spring. And suddenly we've got wet today, but this is the first time in a long time. Um, and plants are suddenly opening up and smiling. Magnolia, care haze bell. Two weeks ago, I noticed the first calyx had just split. I can see it from my bedroom window. And, you know, you get this slash of shrieking chaparelli pink between where the calyx splits. And you think, oh, gosh, it's going to be open for my birthday, which was on the 1st of March. So, yes, it was. Um, but on Tuesday, it is supposedly going to be a very sharp frost. Now, those lovely blooms could be brown by the end of the morning. That's the kind of thing that you're up against. Yeah. But then that's, that's, I guess that's global warming. Um, and, you know, any open flowers um, are in danger of being spoiled because the petal texture is softer. Uh, it's, more, um, it's, it's more liable to shatter, to melt in the frost, really. Mm, I only have one little magnolia in a pot on my patio, Genie. It's one of those really dark, dark ones, purpley yeah. coloured ones, which um is not open. We double check it hasn't. No, it's not it's not popped when I've not been looking. But I generally my magnolia appreciation comes from either visiting gardens like yours where there are loads. You've got every type covered, it feels. Um is it in your East Park? Yes, yes, there, there, there are, uh, there are quite a few. I mean, on the western side of the garden, there's quite a few as well that we've collected over the years. Of, you know, various kinds of magnolias. Um, so yeah, and they go on blooming for quite a time, of course, because you know the very early ones. I mean, like I've just mentioned you care Hayes Bell. There is always the danger. In fact, last year we had a late frost and the, and the blossoms got burnt and brand. Um, but there's always the danger of that sort of thing happening. But because later in the season. It doesn't happen. Mm. 
normally. No. <laughs> <laughs> we started here. There's a a nurseryman local to us called Barry Miller. And Barry Miller, um, he was a trader. as a, a, I mean, a nurseryman, but a trader. And he used to go up to Wisbeach, plant auctions at Wisbeach. And he used to buy a van load or a lorry load of magnolias. And they, you know, it was kind of bidding for them and all that never had a name on any of them so we didn't know what we were buying when this is in the early days of the garden and you could go to barry miller and you could talk to him and you could negotiate a price or if i buy 20 how much is it i mean and we could afford then to buy 20 because we had the space this huge area to fill and it's very strange today that some of the best magnolias that i have are barry miller's specials <laughs> There's not a name amongst them, but I mean, I think I've, I've been able to identify one or two, but that's all. Um, and they bloom. Well, I, I, I tell you what's fascinating. When you suddenly catch sight of a magnolia and you're, I don't know, 100 yards away from it and you can see it over the top of the hedge and you think, gosh, that must be 15 feet tall. <laughs> and that is when you suddenly you get the full beauty of everything. That, I think, is is how I feel about the garden here. I feel lucky enough to have been able to plant those things when I did. Um, and so that 50 years after we came here, which is an incredible thing to say. I mean, I I don't feel it. I don't I don't believe it really. But of course, it, it factually it is true. But 50 years after we came here, those things are those plants are, have grown sufficiently large to be absolutely wonderful. Well, we all um, know the passage of time is such a strange thing. It goes both slowly and quickly. But I mean, in my my life, which is obviously a bit shorter um <laughs> you can't quite believe that you planted something even five ten years ago so i can't mm. really wrap my head around having planted something 50 years ago it's when you get to your forever garden for these <laughs> um and which is what this is for me i mean the thing that the thing that marks the passage of time more than anything else is the growth of trees mm. because when you plant a tree and it's a sapling or a little thing and it's you know maybe under a metre tall, and the day you're able to walk beneath it and look up into its branches, then you think, gosh, you know, you feel like a proud parent, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you do. Well, it's, it's, it's the nice thing, I suppose, about um, my mum having been in her garden for a long time. I mean, it's hilarious that when we moved in, the pear tree, which was already there, but it was tiny, and now it's absolutely yeah. colossal. But it's yeah. like roses when they get those really chunky, characterful uh, yeah, exactly. stems that almost rip the fence apart because they're so sort of mature and strong. And um, in fact, I'm fairly certain the fence across my mum's garden is is basically being held up by the roses now. <laughs> Well, I love I love the the trunk of a pear tree. I mean, the, if you look at it, the pear tree trunk is quite interesting because the the bark sort of gets in little rectangular shapes, doesn't it? Yeah, and, and it's rough and and I just love it. We had one in the garden at my grandparents' house, and I remember that the, the trunk was always. Uh, my grandfather used to cut hazel withies, I think they were called, which you bent and 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 you made uh, for pushing in thatch when you were thatching. Um, but he also used to cut the longer stems, which he would make uh, into supports for runner beans. But they they were cut and then they were stood around the trunk of the pear tree, basically to dry. <laughs> um, you know, it was just fascinating little thoughts like that that come back to you when you've lived such a great age, I'm afraid. <laughs> They're pretty great thoughts. I, I haven't yet got the kind of maturity in my garden, and it's a great sorrow that I fear this winter's loss will be that Euphorbia mellifera I've mentioned before. It may well sprout from the bottom, but it's just been this glorious backdrop to, um, I think, the Clematis Cyboldii, the Florida, the very yeah. fashion flower-looking one. I think that's still alive. I wasn't sure it would make it. You know, there's a good trick to, to growing clematis like that because that is a very exotic looking clematis. And it is, um, I think, a little bit, um, shall we say delicate? I was going to say tender, but I mean, you know, again, what is hardiness today? Um, but I think one of the great tips of, of that, and I learned this by visiting other gardens, I'm visiting Sissinghurst um, Castle in Kent, and they have, they're very famous for a blue flowered clematis, and I can't remember the name of it at the moment, but it's it's on, there's a raised sort of dais and then the, this huge seat and the wall behind the seat is just covered in this clematis. And I re suddenly realised it wasn't one plant, it was about five. 
And there, you see, that you'd learned a lesson. And when you were talking about your clever to Saboldiana or Saboldi, um, part three. Yeah. Part five, if you can afford it. Well, but, you know. I think this is, it is one of those lessons. And I know that technically I've known this for a long time, plant three or five or seven or 11 or whatever we dream of doing in our future gardens that have lots of room. Um, bulbs is definitely somewhere where I haven't done that. Um, or certainly I've done it more over the few years we've been here. But when I started, you don't have much money. You've got an empty garden and you dot things more than you should. And, you know, particularly if they don't make it and your very small clump goes hang down on, rather than clumps up. Hang on just a minute, because you, you touched on a very interesting point there, because um, this is all conjecture, isn't it? I mean, because, you know, somebody with a small garden, they might only have the space for one of this and one of that and one of something else. And so their garden to somebody like me, who's got the space, would look very dotty. But to them, it's it's the pleasure. Well, this is the balance to be struck, particularly for me, when you're obsessed with plants. You want to be able to grow lots of different things. You start trying to find ways... Um, and I, I kind of, I like to think there's a Cedric Morris type element of this, of of painting with similar colours or textures yeah. without having to have the same plant throughout your planting scheme, because obviously that's kind of wasted planting opportunities. Yeah. Um, and it, it can often end up dotty. Sometimes I've managed it with different euphorbias. I've wanted to try different euphorbias. And so I've kind of had lots of different ones, but they've carried a theme through. But I think with bulbs... But particularly because they're small, you can get I could get away with well as long as I can afford it buying more and putting the making an instant bigger clump rather than well waiting. you can do what not um uh, two people came to the garden yesterday whatever their names Sue and Ivan and I was talking we were talking about cyclamen cyclamen I was I bought some cyclamen the other day um and in the pot it's, it's a silver leaf form of cyclamen heterifolium it's it's uh, silver me pink oh, silver yes. yeah and there was a big clump of seedlings in one of the pots and i thought i can't waste those <laughs> and so i was pricking out these tiny little things into cell trays and i put them in a cold greenhouse after i'd watered them ivan saw me doing this and he came along and he said oh he said um you know this cyclamen that you're you're pricking out like this he said do you know what i do with mine at home he said every year i pick off the seed pods uh, you know, the big sort of balloon-shaped seed pods. And he said, I just scrumble them in my hand, run them along the garden. Um, and we've got them all along the, t- the, the side of our drive now because of, uh, because of me doing that. And that's another way of starting gardening, isn't it? You see, yeah. so you have one um, and and you grow or propagate from that one, whichever means is possible. I mean, yesterday I was taking cuttings of, what did I do? Oh, no, some anagallis, which is that little blue pimpernel flower. It's a tender thing for the summer. Um, I had some a uh, couple of old plants in the greenhouse, and I managed to take I think forty forty five cuttings, uh, and then I did some uh, nepeta. There's a new nepeta that I've got, and I wanted that to be propagated up, so I did a tray of cuttings of that. Um, and so, you know, probably financial as much as anything that you can't just go and say, well, well, I'll send me ten of those around. I mean, it'd be wonderful if we could if we could go like the the garden owners of your you know years and years ago they used to take the head gardener to the chelsea plough show and they used to see the man of the nursery and they used to say well I'll, in september i'll have 20 of those and 35 of those and so on <laughs> and so forth and the gentleman or lady of the house would be discussing this with their head gardener going around and that's when they did their ordering but the orders then before container gardening uh or container buying container plants they used to come at the bare root season yeah. um and which is fascinating yeah. and you know that's where well, i suppose you used to prepare a piece of ground and you met, used to heal things in when you didn't when the you know you had to get around to doing them you know when you could find the time to do the job um like for healing bare root roses if you you know it's just a matter of keeping that those roots moist the plant's not growing it's not moving it's dormant really yeah. um so you just keep the roots moist to keep it alive throughout the winter I am excited um, that the roses that I've planted in my garden over the past three or four years, they're, they're really starting to look quite mature now. They're inevitably not trained as well as they should be because they're at the back and I can never reach them. Uh, so, you know, there's there's no triumph there. I'm not feeling particularly smug about my rose training, but it's nice to see them beefing up. And uh, and hopefully this will be a good year for those. There are lots of things I just want to do their thing this year while I'm busy <laughs> and be happy and floriferous. And I'm, it's getting to that exciting time where you're looking out for self-seeders. And um, 
a couple of the Somerset marbles seem to have, so, sorry, the, the honestly, the Lunaria Somerset marble that Alan and I have been quite excited about over the past couple of years, they seem to have seeded through and have come with the mottling. One of them might have died as a result of it seeded right into the base of my cornice that we had to move. So yeah. it might have, have failed in its transportation <laughs> across the garden. We'll see. And I do have a packet of seed that I've been meaning to give you for, well, months and months. <laughs> <laughs> Somerset, marble doesn't Somerset marble doesn't necessarily come true because I, I spoke to Joe about it the other day. And I yeah, think Joe Sharman. Yes, you can get 50% of this and 25% of something else, whatever. Um, so I, I saved some seed of my Somerset marble and I grew them and I got two distinct shades of green in the seedlings. One, um, you know, they were they were all mixed up, of course, but one were much paler green than the other. Um, so it'd be interesting to see what happens, but the mm -hmm. foliage is just green. It doesn't have that that marvellous sort of purple mottling on the foliage. Well, I will eventually send you some seed. Um <laughs> One day when I remember, it's even got a stamp next to it. I finally found a stamp. I got the envelope. They're, ne they're next to each other, but they're not attached and they're not in the post box, crucially. So <laughs> one day you, you will get the seed. I even brought them. This is how baby, bro I'm going to blame baby brain. I brought them to East Ruston in my bag and still didn't give them to you. So one day you will get <laughs> these seeds. I think probably in my garden, what helps is I had one self-seeded wild Lunaria annua. And that's the only thing that could kind of get in there. So maybe that's helped with the seeds coming a bit true, or I don't know, obviously in your garden, you've just got so much going on. Um, yeah, there is so much going on. I do try to keep Linares separate. Um, I mean, Corfu Blue is a good one. I, I like to keep that separate. I've got a new one, which I've got three plants of, which is flowering at the moment. And I, I potted them on when I got them. They came from um, Pan Global Plants. Um, and he says they are much, they are much longer flowering period than ordinary honesty now whether this be true or not i don't know until i tried it but i mean uh nick is a, nick mace is a pretty good guy and i mean i think you know if he says that he's not gonna say it just to sell a few plants because no. i mean the gain is very little um so I, i'm looking forward to trying that one but it's a question of finding somewhere to put it where there's there are not other honesties yeah. but the thing about um honesty is of course there's no two seedlings are ever the same as their parents. They're all genetically different. By the way, that's my cat talking to me in the background. You can probably hear. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, they're, they're yeah, genetically different from each parent. So, you know, the day is going to come when all my honesties are just going into a big melting pot and they're going to mix. And it could be exciting. It might be very dull. It might be, ooh, <laughs> why would we let that happen? But there might just be a few gems amongst the seedlings. Yeah. I was, it's, I'll tell you what I've been doing just lately, which is, is highly satisfying, and that is dahlia tubers. I've been dividing dahlia tubers, and I did I did it yesterday. I bought four, 25 um, dahlia labyrinth. Oh! I, <laughs> it's, it's, this is the thought as dahlia if ever there was. <laughs> it really is. I mean, it has the most stupendous colour, for instance. I mean, it's it's that kind of, it's it's your colours. You're wearing yeah. them today. It's, it's kind of pink and sunset and orange and a bit, a bit, a bit yellow in there and everything. Now, and a dinner plate. It's a dinner plate, isn't it? It is, yes. Yeah. But it's an untidy dinner plate, yeah. which is very informal looking. Even more um, like me. <laughs> <laughs> you said it, hon. <laughs> anyway, I, I bought these tubers. I bought 25 and I actually counted up at the end of my dividing. I couldn't divide them all because some were too small. Um, but I ended up, I think, in, instead of uh, 25, what did I have? 46 or something like that. <laughs> so, you know, that's satisfying because I'm I'm sort of thinking, well, they cost me, I don't know, pound 50 each or something like that for the dried tube. Well, that's 75p, if you see what I mean. So I then started doing it with dahlias that... I'd grown from seed and I got um, a couple of, um, I had a red and white flowered dahlia. It's a, it's a, it's a bit of a messy thing, but it's one of my seedlings. And so I've, I'm, it's precious to me. And so I made that into six. Um, and, <laughs> and I put, I, in, in the propagating house, we have a mist bench, which is heated beneath. And I put, I did a, I did a dahlia tuber and I made it into 13. And, and out of the 13 tubers I planted, tw uh, eight, I've got shoots on them, and some of the shoots are about three inches tall now. So I've got to put that somewhere cool in now to slow the growth down a little bit because with all this frosty weather, you know, they can't go outside. But 
I mean, I can make cuttings out of the, of the, the new shoot. So again, that's another way of propagating and increasing your stock. So if you think, you know, you if you want five dahlias and you think, I really want three of each, just buy the five. And then if you buy them as dry tubers, you can, you can, I start my splitting by very carefully with a very sharp knife, slicing down what remains of the old stem. And I take that down to the top of the tuber and then I gently prise them apart and I pull and you hear this retching, cracking sound and you think, oh, good, good, yeah. but that you'll get a natural break then. And if the, each tuber that's attached to that old stem, that's where the new shoots form. So, you know, you it's it's a pretty painless process. And I think if you're doing it, I wouldn't do it very early in the year. I would only do it when the plant wants to start growing because there is a danger that you might get a little bit of rot where you've wrenched it apart. Um, but normally it, it, it starts growing and everything is fine. But they're just little tricks of the trade that you learn, you know. And I think when you've got a large area to plant, you soon become a decent propagator. And you do have a large area. For anyone who's listening or watching who hasn't had the chance to head to East Ruston, or maybe you've only been at this time of year and you haven't been at the, the sort of peak of dahlia season, you have huge plantings of them, just yeah. glorious. I mean, how many metres long is your your kind of border that's the other side of the walled garden? It's just fabulous. Mm. I should think it's about 50 metres long, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> solid dahlia <laughs> or 30 or probably 30 i don't know uh, it's, it's wonderful um so you, you do definitely need to propagate them <laughs> the other thing that, that happens at the moment with visitors of course that that you know we've been shut for five months and and we know we've been getting on with 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 jobs on a daily basis and some of them are fairly big tasks um and people they're coming in this year and they want to say what's going on where 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 should we go what we see what do we need to see first <laughs> and i I could, say, I could say there's this and there's this, 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 but I don't. What I say is, why don't you just go around the garden and just take it all in and see it as you go? And one of the things that we did last year, um, which is, I'm glad we got round to it before the weather got to be too wet, but um, we moved our compost heap, which is known as the Matterhorn, because it just got piles and piles and piles of stuff on it. So we moved that and we made two, I suppose you'd call them mini Matterhorns, really, on the other side of the desert wash. Um, going into the cornfield and people want to know what we're going to do with that um, and I said well you have to come back and see <laughs> that area is completely transforming it is so different to what it was like before yes, and it indeed. doesn't sound from saying that you know a couple of mini Matterhorns and the meadow it, it feels so different from yeah. what I've seen in February yeah it, 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 it is and it's quite interesting because we're sort of discussing what we're going to be planting on it and we're going to go from sort of uh, I think probably from desert to more arid to the growing plants, um, keeping the theme of the desert. But I mean, it won't be quite the same because the soil is so good. Um, but at least it's got rid of some of the matter or not all of it. Um, <laughs> I wanted some of it to be left there just in case we need to top up with good soil. From, uh, also add to my compost, you know, anyway. It's always useful. Um, and then the other thing is, of course, we've, to, I mean, I don't know, probably must be, hmm. 15, 20 years ago, we planted up the, the tree fern garden. What I what happened was I actually had, we did a scheme for somebody in on the island of uh, Guernsey. And we used something like 36 tree ferns in a serpentine avenue at the bottom of a valley. And Guernsey is a very green, uh, mild and wet island. And because tree ferns love it. And they've been spectacular there. They really have looking wonderful but having done that suddenly a lorry arrived at the gate one day and it said three ferns for alan gray oh, what's all this about well they're your commission but i didn't realize that i was even getting commission i mean you know and so we made the, the tree fern garden we had a grid of 16 formerly planted tree ferns unfortunately we misjudged the amount of water and moisture and shelter they need and they were a little bit too tall um, and they didn't grow terribly well. And, you know, they grew fine for the first couple of years, and then they got a little bit smaller, and one became a bit more stunted and so on and so forth. So in the end, we bit the bullet and said, we've got to move them all because it's just too dry, too, too sunny, uh, too exposed um, to wind and weather and everything else. So we, we dug them out. Not all of them survived, actually, uh, but about uh, two or three died, I think, which was a sad thing. But... We put them in the woodland garden and by and large, they have grown very well. 
and we replace them with the catalpas. Uh, catalpas, for those who don't know, it, the Indian bean tree. But ours are peculiar catalpas because the stem to about eight or nine feet tall is catalpa bignonioides. But the heads are catalpa bignonioides nana. So the, the, the dwarf form is grafted on top of the, the, the ordinary form, which means that you, this is something I saw in France, actually. These have been used as street trees in towns in France. You know, the France, French, the French have a very formal way of sort of gardening much more so than probably the English do. And um, they like to, the things in straight lines and all the rest of it. But it means that we can ki- cut the heads and we can keep them really quite tight. Um, so therefore, you're not getting huge amounts of shade. And so we pl- replaced our um, tree ferns with Catalpa bignonioides and Nana on the top. And then we decided that we would, well, if we're doing this, we might as well do, redo the whole garden virtually. Um, and so we did that um, and we edged it this winter. Um, I the Behind the wooden edging, I planted Ophiopogon planus Garpus nigrescens, um, the little black grass, which is not a grass at all. It's related to lilies. Um, I've used that as a, an edging. Um, and somebody said to me the other day, did you copy that from York Gate, the garden just outside Leeds? And I said, no, I don't think I did. And then I thought, but that idea must have come from somewhere and it's laying in your subconscious and it's something you saw that you found attractive. And so perhaps I did. I don't know. Because it is very uh, effective at York Gate. That, yeah. that, I mean, I've, I've, I've said it before. I've, I've been won over by the Ophiopogon, but it's never been my favourite uh, because I've seen it used so badly so many times. But that particular planting and I'm sure the one in the Catalpa Garden as well. Uh, just fabulous. But, but you see that, uh, you know, that's how I... How things lay in your brain and they 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 pop up and you've probably forgotten where the inspiration came from. But talking about Ophiopogons, there are some very nice ones, you know, um, and they're they're very late. So if you want to keep your garden going and you don't want to have masses of asters or chrysanthemums, try some Ophiopogons because uh, or Liriopis. Liriopis are probably even better. Uh, the Liriopis with the purple and the white berries on them. They're absolutely stunning things. I tell you a, a thing I want to do. Uh want to do this year probably never happened um but I was given a clump of liriope that got dug up from she's not my mother-in-law but you know her garden and um and I popped it next to a pot of the coleus burgundy wedding train yeah and it sort of sat there and um absentmindedly and it came into flower and I was going in and out of the back door and I suddenly thought this combination of colours, the purple of the Liriope flowers and the burgundy wedding train foliage, which is, it's all kind of crinkled around the edges and it's reds and greens and creams and they looked amazing together. And I was talking to Joe Sharman about this and he's like, but you can't, you can't plant them together in the garden because they want two dissimilar levels of light, but I want to do them in a pot so that they can kind of briefly live together when they're at their their moment and uh, and see if it works because it was so beautiful well you just said something then uh, that i mean i firmly believe that you, sh- you should never tell somebody not to do something <laughs> because if you tell tell me not to do something i'll just go ahead and do it anyway just for the hell of it because i'm determined that you know I, this we had this conversation a few years ago now but when we first planted camasses in our in our wildflower meadow um i bought probably 50 Camassia bulbs, I suppose, which was an enormous extravagance at the time. And um, <laughs> our water table here is 19 feet below the surface. Camassias, um, I'm told, and the RHS um, books tell you this, that they need a fairly mo- fairly moist soil. Well, that they haven't got here. Today, there must be 500 Camassias in that area. Um, so plants are nothing if not adaptable. And it might not be exactly to their liking or, or, or like from, from where they were found. But, you know, every plant wants to grow. It doesn't want to die. And it will do so with varying levels of vigour. Mm. And some plants, I mean, Illyriope, Illyriope, however we want to say it, pretty robust. You know, it's a good yes. doer. So you'd think it would be fairly tolerant. And well, the one thing I think that spoiled uh, Lyriope is they've been used a lot in um, municipal planting, mm. shall we say. <laughs> I mean, Richard Hobbs on the radio was talking on Saturday about how municipal planting and the way the plants are treated. I mean, they just, you know, go over with a hedge cutter. So you make these dollops and 
you know, you as a horticulturalist or a gardener, you don't want to look at them because they've been tortured beyond belief. But, you know, it takes away the beauty of the plant. And in the same way that we see huge beds outside supermarkets of Liriopis, for instance, mm -hmm. they're planted there for, for a very good reason. And the reason is that they are good plants. They do well where they're planted. But the, the association that we have with them thereafter is rather sport them for use in our own gardens. And I think that's a great shame. Mm. Oh, it happens to so many things. I mean, you know, I know you have your feelings about Viburnum tinus. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I've actually got one outside the window here, which I bought because it's supposed to be a superior plant and it is because the foliage is slightly lighter than the ordinary ones but there's an awful lot of pink in the flower and I mean strong pink it's not just that wishy-washy grey which normally you know a viburnum tinus years ago a viburnum tinus was a viburnum tinus we had one in the garden and I remember we used to pick um bits off it to make posies to take to the church at Easter for the for you know to make posies for your mother um, at the Easter service and things. Um, today, the Viburnum tinus that I'm looking out at is a much superior thing. It's plant breeders, you see, <laughs> I'm often banging on about plant breeders and sort of going, bah, humbug, because <laughs> they, they produce the, a couple of examples of primroses with flowers far too big for their own good and busy lizzies, exactly the same, on plants that are much smaller than they should be, um, which causes me distress because the proportions are completely wrong and I don't like it. Um, other people love them. I mean, I, you know, there's you, you go to our local farm shop, go into one of the tunnels full of primroses. The one thing that you, I have to shut my eyes when I go in there because they're so <laughs> garish, but I go in because the scent's so wonderful and it really is um, lovely. But, you know, sometimes plant breeders get things right as AKA my verb, my burnum tinus. Um, so there's an awful lot of improvement. I think plant breeders don't just breed to make smaller squatter plants, although, of course, <laughs> that it would make sense because you can get many more plants on a Dutch trolley if you're transporting them across the country. Yeah. Talking of primroses and impatiens, first of all, um, very few plants got brought in to protect them this uh, winter because our uh, house is, is in baby chaos. But I did bring in my Congo cockatoo, um, and uh, and I, I noticed flower buds on it in the downstairs toilet uh, where everything goes to overwinter if I can possibly make it happen. Uh, so I'm very excited about that. And I was looking back through my um, my photos from last March, last April, and I got so excited about all the primroses I bought, which Tejetos, the Greek one that I got from you, yeah. is already mm. been flowering for weeks. I think. Yes, that, that's very early. It's it is very, very early. Yeah. Beautiful. It needs frequent division, by the way. Ah, well, that's worth knowing. So, yeah, well, I mean, <laughs> you know, it flowers and flowers and flowers. It doesn't set any seed, it's sterile. Um, but I think it came from Christine Skilmersdale, uh, Broadly Garden. So, I mean, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a damn good plant. She's had it for years. Um, and I've been dividing mine over a period of years now. So, well, oh, here comes the cat. <laughs> I do apologise, everybody. <laughs> I think I might be a highlight of the podcast. <laughs> it's going back again the other way. Go on, go on. Centre of attention, Boy. beautiful stripy tail. <laughs> well, yeah, that's yeah. that's worth knowing. I will have to keep an eye on mine. It's been lovely to just see it flowering alongside the snowdrops um, in my raised bed. But I, mm. I did get quite. Well, they're so they're so affordable, and if you go to the right plant sales, you do find some really interesting ones, and they're not you know it's not a huge investment and they're so beautiful so hopefully they will have survived and I'll have I think there's a hose and hose wander in my little collection uh, that fingers crossed will return um anyway a whole I had a great problem. aunt called great aunt Ginny and she was a whiz with Primula wander um and she had she uh, at her side door of her house there's the path and then there was a low wall and then um a sloping bed and that bed was covered with uh, Primula Wanda. And I can tell you, she did that by division, because if I tell you that she was, shall we say, parsimonious, to say <laughs> the least, <laughs> the dear Aunt Ginny didn't didn't waste money. And yet she had this fantastic display of Primula Wanda. Oh. Um, so frequent division is the, is the key. Yeah, I've got my eyes peeled, fingers crossed. I think, um, I think one or two of them definitely kind of held back from where they might have been at this point last year whether that's my mm. care whether it's the season whether it's last summer I don't know but 
fingers crossed. You know, I can't continue to surprise you because um, it's strange. You have sort of passions and interests in certain plants. I love violets um, and mm. so does Monk Jack. <laughs> decimated some of my violets but i've got one or two named forms of violets and there's a lovely tall dark purple one tall for a violet only about four inches tall but you know and um flowering away just in the winter garden at the moment which looked lovely and i went yesterday to look at my clump of a pink violet and it's gone completely gone and that was last summer i'm sure because of the the drought and then i spied three little seedlings that are popping up and they've each got a flower bud on them um, and so I'm going to make sure that I take care of those. My my loveliest surprise of all was um, Jane Ann Walton came to the garden last year and she brought me a present of a little a double violet. It's purple and white and it's very highly scented. And I wasn't quite sure how hardy it was. And so I planted it in the garden and then it made a little runner, which I rooted in a pot and I took the pot in the greenhouse for the winter. Um, and suddenly it starts flowering. There's this most delicious scent. And I'm suddenly thinking to myself, you know, this is what everybody can have if they have a greenhouse. They don't need heat because violets don't want heat. But you just get the sun making the temperature just go up that little bit um, so that, you you know, the violets are, shall we say, a week or two earlier than those outside. Um, and I just sort of think to myself what you can grow without heat under glass. And it's quite a long list of things. Yeah. Um you know, it's it's it'd be an interesting thing to do. Well, over time, I'm sure I'll be experimenting with my really, really terrible unheated greenhouse on the allotment. If it doesn't blow apart <laughs> over the next, it's, it's, it's still there. Might blow apart, you know, between now and next year, but we'll see. Um, it was funny last year, you allowed me to head out with a trowel and dig up some violets from your garden. So I have yeah. got a few uh, dotted here and there, but people, I swear they thought I was just stealing them. I just... <laughs> Some rogue person out there with trowel nicking all the violets. I'm sure. I'm sure you told them otherwise. <laughs> Hello. Can you see me? I can see you. Good. Like your polo neck, turtle neck it's thing. A, it's, it's kind of polo neck. We're sort of. Mm, very nice. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought you know the coming forecast. It needs to be something warm. Yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, actually, we haven't turned the heating on, so I think I've rather um, overestimated the temperature. I'm a bit chilly, but I'm sure <laughs> I will. I'm sure I will get warm over the course of the podcast. Dumpy little um, <laughs> self-conscious. Sorry, somebody outside the window. Oh well. <laughs> In common parlance, she was tight as a nun's knicker. <laughs> <laughs> you can cut that out if you like. <laughs> <laughs>